This week on the DTD podcast, we have Army veteran and 38-year Los Angeles County Sheriff's Homicide Detective Gil Carrillo stopping by the studio to let us know all about his exploits in the seedy city of Los Angeles. So let's get right into it. Crazy Dutch bastard. What we've got here is failure to communicate. 60% of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. That's cute. I remember when I had my first beer. Why so serious? I am serious. And don't call me sir. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD podcast. This one is going to be a good one this week. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've seen this guy recently on your Netflix. Uh, he has become very famous, I would say, within the last month. But a little bit about Gil before we get into it. 38 years as a Los Angeles County Sheriff, one of the youngest homicide detectives ever. He investigated over 700 murders in his career. He retired at the rank of lieutenant, and now he travels around lecturing and teaching the new breed of detective that's on the scene. So let's get into it. Gil, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you. It's an honor, and thank you for having me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I want to talk about everything, not just your police career tonight, but you have been in public service pretty much your entire life. Uh, You have served in the military. You were a crew chief in Vietnam. So I want to talk about that first. What about your upbringing made you go into this life of service that you've done for over 40 years total? The truth of the matter was it's my upbringing that brought brought me to the position I'm in. (laughs) Okay. At the age of seventeen, at the age of seventeen, a uh, young deputy sheriff uh, took me home and told my parents, "Better sign for this boy to get off the streets, or he's going to end up dead or in prison." So, at the age of seventeen, right after high school, I entered the United States Army, and uh, ended up right after two months after my 18th birthday, I was in a place called Vietnam, and Vietnam gave me a new appreciation on life and made me think about things other than what I was doing and. It just turned my whole life around. It matured me real quick. And, 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 you know, I think it does to a lot of people. When I joined the military, I didn't even really know what I was doing. Um, I just kind of did it as a kind of off the cuff thing. I, uh, my uncle had been in the military and he kind of talked me into it. Um, and I joined the national guard at first when I was in high school and then went over to active duty, but it does grow you up a lot and it gets you kind of set on a path where you think, you know, it, it could be worse than this. It could be better than this. And you kind of figure out what you want to do in life. Is that what you kind of felt whenever you joined? Oh, no doubt. I, when I joined, I had no idea what I was getting into. Right. Uh, it was the first time I was ever away from home. First time I was ever away from uh, my buddies back on the block. And it was a whole different world. I ended up on the East Coast and ended up in Vietnam. When I came out of Vietnam, I had uh, after I got out of the Army, I had three goals in life. One was I wanted to go to college. Uh, I have six sisters, no brothers, but I want to be the first one in my family to go to college. At that time in my life, I was still a little naive. I thought only rich white people went to college and I was going to go. So I started going to college right away. Goal number two was I wanted to become a cop. I wanted to become a deputy and give back what was once given to me. And that's a new lease on life. I wanted to be able to reach out to people and help them get off the streets or help them stay out of trouble and give them something positive to look forward to. The third thing I wasn't so proud of, and that was I wanted to start dating the girlfriend that I had when I went to Vietnam who wrote me a dear John. (laughs) Okay. I wanted to start dating. I wanted to start dating her, getting her out of the palm of my hand, and then uh, break up with her and watch her suffer like I had suffered in Vietnam. (laughs) So as the story goes, I got out in June of 1970. By September of 70, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. And then the day after Christmas, there it was. Booyah, we got married. And we just got done celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary this past uh, December 26th. So I got two out of three. 
Well, so let, let's talk about that for a minute. So you come back, you decide, I'm going to date this girl. She tortured me while I was in Vietnam. And I want to get into a little more of Vietnam. But she tortured you while you're in Vietnam. You want to, you, you, you say you're coming back just to get her to eat out of the palm of your hand so that you can break up with her. And then, boom, you're married. So what was it that, that got you to go, oh, you know what? I shouldn't break up with this girl. I should probably marry her. I don't know. Somebody, somebody once said love is blind and it was love. You know, I obviously what I wanted to do wasn't what I down deep inside subconsciously really didn't want to do. Uh, and once I got her back then I didn't want to let her go again. And fortunately for me, she wanted to hold on to me this time as well. So it's worked out for the both of us. Well, that's uh, awesome. Um, so let's talk about Vietnam for a little bit. Uh, you go over there, you spend three years in the Army total, one year in Vietnam. You're a crew chief with the 189th uh, Assault Helicopter Company. Uh, you're stationed near the Cambodian border. Uh, I'm sure you're running mission after mission, especially being that close to the Cambodian border. What is it that, that sticks out in your head when you got over to Vietnam? You know, you, you said that you had been on another path. They got you set on the right path. You go in the army, you go over to Vietnam. What's your first thought as you hit the ground over there? Uh, it, it wasn't the, so much the first time uh, when I first got there. As a matter of fact, uh, they said we need six volunteers right now to go on a search and destroy mission. Well, I had already had uh, about eight of my buddies from back home die in Vietnam. So I wanted revenge. I, let's go. I want to avenge your death. And my hand shot up. I was one of the first six. And it was... After that day, I learned you never volunteer in the, in the army because the search and destroy mission was jump in the back of deuce and a half truck and with some diesel fuel and go around looking at all the outhouses and pulling out a half cut, a 50 gallon drum that's cut in half that was used for the toilet, pour gasoline in it. You search, you pour diesel fuel in it and light it up and destroy. That was my first search and destroy mission in Vietnam. So it, it was only a couple of days there. Then I went to my unit of assignment, which was the 189th. Uh, it was right at the beginning of the Tet Offensive. And I was warned, they're throwing everything at us. Uh, so just be ready, kid. And that first night, rockets started coming in, mortars started coming in the air base. I was scared to death. I got up and hit my head on a beam above my, <laughs> above my bunk, low crawled on some concrete, got to the, uh, front door of the hooch that we were living in and there stood one of my flying buddies and just said welcome to the nom kid it's all over you can get up now and uh, <laughs> that was my initiation into vietnam and i just learned real quick that if you panic you die so you just have to remain calm through everything now flying in the helicopters then being a crew chief is a little different um than just being a, a, a crew chief because i'm guessing did you have a door gunner did you act as a door gunner uh or did you just act as the crew chief how, how did that work out over there no there was uh you have the aircraft commander the co-pilot crew chief and a gunner okay and the gunners on one side and the crew chiefs on the other and when you're up in the air and you're flying you're on your gut and the crew chief then, as well as the gunner, you're an extra set of eyes. When you go in and you have to make extractions or make insertions, and you have to go into what we would call hover holes where you're, they've just blown up an area so you can get the rotors enough, enough to fit a, fit a helicopter in there, you're looking for any obstacles that's going to hit the blades, and you're leaning out, and you're then directing the pilots, whoever's got control of the aircraft. Right. Uh, little to the left, little to the right. You know, watch your tail, move forward, move up, take it up, take it down. And how many people you get on board, you control how many people get on board or what they're going to put on board. And then you tell them what's left. That helicopter was just like a uh, weapon to a Dallas police officer. You sign for your equipment when they give it to you. Well, I signed for my helicopter. And I said when it went up, if I didn't think it was airworthy, well, then we had to get somebody down here to fix it. So you're controlling... Uh, the back part of the aircraft, the pilots are keeping you safe. They're flying. Yeah. So, and when you're doing this, um, of course, this is something that you've you've never done in life. You get over there; it's a whole new world. Did you did you change your opinion? Did you? I don't want to say soften, but did you soften your approach? Because you said when you got over there, you had had somebody's die, and you were looking for revenge and stuff. Did you find as you were there, um, you? 
you didn't have that necessarily revenge. You had more of a mentality of that was your job. That's what you had to do. Or did you keep that the whole time you were over there? No, there was, it was filled with much more compassion. Uh, there, the one thing I learned about combat is there are absolutely no winners in war. I don't care what side you're fighting for. You're both fighting for something your country believes in. You're doing what you think is right. And I'm not saying that we're wrong. I'm just saying that nobody wins. Right. Uh, while I was there, I had time to go ahead. The guys from my unit, we got together and we helped start an orphanage over there uh, for kids, for homeless kids that needed shelter. And so we were able to help start an orphanage. And in fact, uh, fortunate enough, we still get word. Uh, one of the kids that lived in that orphanage is now resident of Southern California. Oh, really? Yes. So we... We still hear from uh, what we did back then, doing good. And the orphanage is still growing stronger than ever. Wow. So uh, when you're over there and and you you kind of change your life, now w- when is it in your tour in Vietnam that you get this letter from your future wife that says that uh, <laughs> you guys are done? That's probably about halfway through my tour. Uh, <laughs> I was, I don't know. I got it. I was broken hearted, but <laughs> I did it. And, and then I went from flying slicks that the, the insertions uh, and extractions, those were called slicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, your medevacking resupply insertion extraction. Uh, but I got tired of doing that because whenever you get shot at, other than when you're in a hover hole trying to pick somebody up, but when you're just flying anywhere, you get shot at, well, then all you do is pull up and get out of, get out of there and call the guns in to come in and clean up what you had to run away from. Right. And I finally, I got tired of that. I wanted to, I wanted to be a gunny. So I switched over to gunships. Now there, you're not landing out in the boonies. You you don't have to watch watch for anything else. You're just there as a, as a gunner. Right. You got a freewheeling 60 machine gun that's hanging from a bungee cord on your arm with pistol grips on it. And when it's time to go hot, you lean out and you go hot and you're just shooting everything you can. Fortunately, we saw very little of our combatants. You know, you don't you don't see uh, too many people that you're shooting at. You see muzzle flashes, and that's about it. Right. Um, did you ever come across where you could see out of the helicopter what you were doing, and I, it gives it a whole new perspective when you can actually see everything that's going on. So with you doing everything being, you know, resupply, being medical, being a gunner, being all those different things at any point, did you look out and, and it's like the scariest time that you've been over there. Like what one stands out in your mind being over there of looking out, not necessarily seeing the enemy, but seeing something that really kind of sent waves through you. Well, you, you never, uh, as I said earlier, I learned early on, if you panic, you lose. Somebody mm-hmm. dies if you panic. So what you have to do is concentrate on remaining calm. You've got a job to do. Uh, you've got a mission. Fulfill your mission. Fulfill your job. And hopefully you'll come out okay. And the one stands out. I was the last one, last individual to see an American GI uh, before he got killed. And we were pulling four people out on ropes from a hover hole where you're 100 feet up, dropping 100-foot ropes down there. Mm-hmm. And it's like watching a scene from combat. I mean... These guys were back to back, shooting around, trying to keep themselves protected, trying to keep us protected. They were throwing grenades. They were doing everything. And I watched the GI give up his harness for another soldier that was on his team, gave up to a South Vietnamese soldier that was part of his team. Oh, wow. Gave it up. And then we pulled up. He stood there by himself, continued fighting as we extracted. He lost his life. Uh, they sent another right behind us. They sent another bird in there. They got him out. And it was, uh, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And we, uh, it was a firefight on everybody. Everybody was fighting. And uh, it was one that I'll never forget, but one that everybody did everything they were supposed to do. That's why he got out alive with the exception of the decedent. Well, and, and mostly because he gave up his harness is why he didn't make it out of there. Uh, not not exactly. anything because of the guys surrounding him or the helicopters or anything like that. It was because he chose that, uh, which is like the highest 
I mean, of course he deserved the, the Medal of Honor on that one. Sure. So when you're taking fire like that, what's going through your mind? Because as at this time, you're are you a gunner right now, right? Or are you acting? Yeah, on, okay. So so you're on a gun. At this time, I was on a slick. Okay. For that particular mission, I'm on a slick. I'm in a hub roll. So I have to, I have two functions. Okay. I have to keep the blades, keep the pilot concentrated on flying. Okay. And and I can still, to this day, remember uh, Mr. John. I talked to him once after I got on the department. He saw me on the news and went through the department. <laughs> we talked. I can still hear him saying he had the stick. He had control. And I can just hear him saying, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> And he, he was just, oh, my God, to death. And I just said, it's okay. It's okay. They're just throwing white softballs at us. We're good. We're good. You just keep trying to keep him calm. Right. Because couldn't get him stuck and shooting back and keeping an eye on the guys down below. I had to ensure I'm the one. He can't look down. He's looking straight ahead. And at his instruments, I'm looking down. And I had to let him know. I made the decision when everybody was tied up and let's go. Now let's get out of here. And once we're lifting up and out, then it should continue. You have to go beyond the tree line because you have these guys dangling from rope right. below. So you get up above the tree line, then you get the bodies above the tree line. Then you say, okay, let's go. Let's get out of here. Then you, you fly away and you're safe. And during that time, you're just putting down as much firepower as you can to keep those guys hopefully pinned down and uh, get away. So... As this progresses on, what what rank do you leave Vietnam as? I left as an E five. Okay, so you left Especially as a sergeant. E5. Sergeant. Uh, what what did you get over there as? As a private E two. Okay, so I you... know I take that back. I take that back. I got private E two. A few of us got E two out of basic training. Okay. Then we went to advanced training. I went to Fort Stewart, Georgia, for training, and out of Fort Stewart, I got E four. I I later learned that they were pretty pretty quick to give me E4, but in order to be a crew chief in Vietnam, you had to be an E4. Okay. So, <laughs> so there's the reason for giving. I was not that I was good. This is we need a body and a helicopter, and you have to be an E4. But what's the saying? It's better to be lucky than good any day. So uh, exactly. Yeah. So you go I'll over there. It. You even received the air medal uh, with a V for valor. Uh, do you remember that mission that you received that for? Yeah, those those medals came uh, over the year. I got medals for different things, but those were coming out of that uh, that flight that I just told you okay. about. And uh, they were we were. I saw my company commander at a reunion, and he said he had put us in for silver star. He still had the paperwork. Mm -hmm. uh, he put us in for silver stars. Everybody on the aircraft, and uh, Army being the Army said we'll give the pilot. The Silver Star, the the uh, aircraft commander, the co-pilot got a Bronze Star, and we got air medals with V for Valor. Yeah, that that sounds just like the Army. Uh, yeah. I I think that travels over into the civilian world for a lot of stuff too. <laughs> sure. So, before you go to Vietnam, how much time do you spend in the Army? Because you spent you spent a total for three years. So you were over there for a year. Did you come back and still have more time to do back in the states, or were you done with your time by then? No, I had more time to do back in the States. They sent me to, uh, oh, they sent me to Georgia and I really disliked, it was 1969. I, I didn't like Georgia at all. I was only there for about six months because they had, uh, segregation back then. Right. And they had whites only and blacks only. And I'm looking at myself and I said, where do I go? You know, they had <laughs> coloreds only and you could, so I had to stay on base. I didn't like it. It's not the way I was raised. It's not the way I was brought up. And so I signed waivers to go back uh, to Vietnam. I wanted to, I said, I'd rather be back there fighting. The first gunner, my first gunner that got shot was a black male. And uh, I could, he could get shot flying to the United States of America. He'd get shot protecting me, but yet we couldn't go out together. And right. it was just absurd. So, so I just put in a transfer to go back to Vietnam and I, I, told them you had to sign up for another year. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll extend my duty and I'll sign up for another year. The few months later, I got a letter back that my transfer had been approved. 
and to go see the company commander. So I went to see the company commander and he said, okay, he tried to talk me into re-enlisting in the army and a $10,000 variable re-enlistment bonus. And I told him that I had a bitter taste in my mouth. And I didn't like what was going on. And in order to get away, I had to sign up to go back to Vietnam. Now the army had made a mistake and they gave me letters. They gave me transfer orders to go to Germany as a private E2 light wheeled vehicle mechanic. And I told the company commander, I'll make you a deal. You allow me to go. Don't stop these orders. And I promise you, I will consider reenlisting. You have my word. And he says, I'll make you a deal. I won't stop you, but I won't lie for you either. So if they catch it, you know, I'll tell them, yeah, it's a mistake. But if not, I, I give you some advice. Take your flight orders and your rank orders. And so when I got to Germany, they didn't catch it. And they called private E2 Carrillo. I said, well, there seems to be a mistake. Here I am. <laughs> so I gave them my orders, my status, and they sent me to... Fourth, third infantry division, Audie Murphy's old unit, third infantry division. At over in headquarters. Schweinfurt. Yeah, they sent me there and I took over uh, the general's aircraft. The kid oh. that was flying and had no experience, so they, they gave me the general's aircraft and I got to fly for the general for uh, a while. And it, and it was funny because I loved my flight jacket and had personality. It came from Vietnam. And the general's aide told me, this is uh, one morning, he says, Gil, the general would like you to get a new flight jacket. And I said, okay, not a problem. So I went to the supply sergeant. And I said, uh, excuse me, want to see about getting a new flight jacket? And he says, you're the new kid, aren't you? And I said, oh, yes, sir. And he says, well, and this is January. And he says, well, why don't you come back around August? He says, we'll see if we can get you a new flight jacket by then. I said, sounds good to me. I didn't want one. It's the general that wants me. They have a new one. He said, oh, you're flying for the general now. Said, yes, sir. Said, Hold on. He went and got me a flight parka. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. And yeah, that had to have months. its perks. Yeah, so I flew for three months, and I had put in for an early out. I wasn't going to go ahead and sign re-up. So I put in for an early out. My early out was granted. And then the general's aide come up, and he says, Gil, he says, the general's going to be taking a European vacation. He's taking the bird with him. So you can go on a vacation. It'll be a working vacation because you'll have to maintain the bird. Or you can stay here at your unit and be exempt from duty till the time you leave because he says you've got an absolutely great record. And I said, well, tell the general have a nice vacation. <laughs> so I stood back and uh, I was exempt from duty. My company commander at that time was a guy named Colonel Bristow. And I reported back to him and I said, right. did they tell you what's going on? He said, yeah, they did. He says, they told me all I had to do was stand Reveille. <laughs> he says, well, you and I are getting out of this army at the same time. You've done good. I've been happy. Got no regrets. He says, just let somebody know you're alive at least once a week. You can do whatever you want to. I don't care. <laughs> so it was a great three months. So what did you, a lot of beer, I guess? Well, it wasn't a beer drink, a lot of wine. And, and I had made some uh, German friends. Okay. I was going I was going places that the GIs didn't go. GIs all went down to Würzburg, you know, the big town where all the ladies were. I had become really good friends with the guy that picked me up at the airport, Elias Ochoa. And he was married. He had a he had a child, a newborn. I became godfather of that child. And oh, he wow. used to take his wife to a little uh little place called Prichstadt, which was the smallest legal sized town in Germany, I understand. And so I went there. And because I'd go hang with them, and I was one of about five GIs that would go into this. They only had one one guest house, one discotheque, and I'd go down there with about five. There were maybe five of us at the most that would go down there, and I got to mingle with the Germans and the locals. <clears throat> and the best thing that happened was uh, a the owner of she was almost like the owner of the town. Everybody respected him. Everybody feared him. He came up and sat at the table I was at one night and with her through an interpreter, uh, Odie. Odie says, uh, Herr Gill, Herr Fosterly wants to talk to you. I said, all right. So he sat right in front of me, across from me, very seriously said, uh, I want you to know that I was a former SS trooper. <laughs> and I had to kill many GIs at times with a garrote. What say you? 
And I looked at him and I said, I've just come back from Vietnam where I had to kill many Vietnamese. I said, I don't hate all Vietnamese and I hope all Vietnamese people don't hate me. War is hell and there are no winners. You did what you thought was right for your country at the time. I did what I thought was right for my country at the time. And he looked at me and he said, das ist gut, mein Freund, das ist gut, which means that is good. And he stood up, he told him to stop the music. He stood up and then Odie told me, oh my God, Gil, you must dance. So I stood up and he made an announcement inside the place. And he said that I was his friend. And if there's anybody that didn't like it, step forward. And both of us would kick the shit out of all of them or we die trying. <laughs> so nobody stepped forward and everybody started clapping. And it was like giving me the key to the city. And come to find out, he had a uh, daughter that was married to an American lieutenant. And that American lieutenant had never stepped foot in his house. Uh, Herr Fosterling hated him because he had never seen combat and didn't understand what it was like and didn't, uh, I guess he didn't take well to Miss Herr Fosterling being an old SS trooper. And uh, so he hated him, didn't associate with him, wasn't allowed in his house. But myself, he took me to his house, gave me rides. Uh, and like I said, it was like giving me the key to the city. They just, I was overwhelmed with the, the friendship and the affection that they uh, bestowed upon me. Now, any of those guys, uh, I'm sure he's too old now, but it, do you still talk to any of those guys? No, none of the guys uh, that I served with in Germany. I didn't get that close to any of them other than Elias. And Elias is now deceased. I have talked to his wife and I talked to uh, my goddaughter every once in a while. I uh, still, well, she was lost for years. I couldn't find them. Mm -hmm. And then through social media, she found me and we read, it, it's just wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. I express my love for her and she expresses her love for me, the affection we have. And, uh, there's a bond. That That's really cool that, that, that holds up to today. And, and it goes to show social media is a lot of bad things with social media, but there are some things that can really be done with it, you know, connecting people. So you get done in Germany, you get out of the military, uh, you come back, you put this plan into motion. You got three things. You're going to be a detective or you're going to be a, a sheriff. A cop. A cop. Yeah. I want to be yeah. a cop. Yeah. Uh, you want to be a cop. You want to uh, break this girl's heart after you win her affection. You want to break this girl's heart and you want to go to school. Yes. What order does it go in when you get back? I started school as soon as I got out. I started out summer session of college right away. I uh, start seeing my, my former girlfriend right away. She kind of shocked me. Uh, she, had a she had a relative, a cousin that lived right next door to her who was a friend of mine as well. And I went to visit that cousin and while I was there, someone else called up another old friend of mine, a female who was friends with myself and friends with, and used to work with my then wife or my girlfriend. Right. And, uh, she happened to call over the cousin's house and I started talking to her and she said, why don't you come on down? And I said, well, I don't know where you live. And she says, well, Pearl does, Pearl will tell you. And so then my wife came, my girlfriend came over and I said, Hey, uh, she just called up. The gal just called and wants us, wants me to go down there. You said, she said, uh, you know, where she looks, she said, sure. And so she'll be right back. She went to her house. She came back and then she jumped right in the passenger seat of my car and she says, okay, let's go. And I remember her, I said, what did you tell your mom? Cause your mom, was not a big fan of mine. She, her mother didn't like me at all. Why is that? And I was three years younger than my wife. Okay. And uh, my girlfriend and she, she had an ex-boyfriend and my mother-in-law liked him. That was the man, you know, he, he used to bring roses for the mother-in-law. When I was a kid, I didn't bring her nothing. You know, right. I didn't. So he, he had won the mother-in-law's heart. She got in and I put it in reverse. I said, what'd you tell your mother? She said, I told her I was going out on a date with you. Let's go. And that started. And then we just got closer. And that told me that she was letting her mom know what was going on. 
Right. And so we started dating and one thing led to another. And before you know it, we're making plans for marriage. And the day after Christmas, we did. So you got school. You have pretty much accomplished the second thing. You say you didn't accomplish, but I, I think you did. You 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 won yeah. her. You might not have finished the goal of it, but you did win her. So now yes. is becoming a cop. So That's right. what year are we in right now? Uh, we're in 1970. I got okay. married December 26, 1970. October 1st of 1971, I swore in as a deputy sheriff. Okay. Uh, duties. What What do you start as uh, doing? Where Where's your uh, beats and all that kind of stuff? Where Where do you start? Well, you you started out as I started out as a, with a 26 week academy at that time. Graduated from the academy, got immediately transferred uh, to the jail where most young deputies start out. Worked the jail for two and a half years. After working jail duty for two and a half years, I transferred out to East Los Angeles Patrol, which now, this is 1974, this is the gang capital of the world. It's, it's flooded with gangs, that's where gangs were hot and heavy. And so that's where I started my patrol work. Did patrol work there for, oh, four years. I had, I started getting trainees. I was breaking boots in. And then they had me working gangs because of my background on the streets. They, I started working uniform gang detail or gang suppression. And I did that uh, for a few years and I got out of gangs. I didn't like the way they worked gangs because they were using uniform gangs. And I, I said, nope, this isn't for me. I just went back to straight patrol. And then they approached me again. They said, we want you to come back to gangs. I said, I, I don't want to do it. And they said, why not? And I said, you're not working it right. You know, you need to have plain clothes. And they said, well, we heard you before. We're starting a plain clothes gang unit. We want you to run it. And so I said, all right. So. I got, uh, I got to pick my partner and we worked gangs, uh, there at the street level, playing clothes gang unit for East Los Angeles station, did that for a few years and because of all the work we did with, uh, gangs and gang murders, helping out the guys from homicide, they would go ahead and call me, uh, they'd call my partner and myself to help them on their murder. Sometimes giving us crack at the suspect first before they talked to them, which was really unheard of, they, but they had that much confidence. And then the next thing I know, I'm being told that homicide's asking if I want to transfer up there. And I was, I was so excited because that was my goal. Once I became a patrol deputy after getting as many homicides as we did out in East LA, I just, uh, they were creme de la creme. These were hard working. They were the bulldogs, but they were hard working dogs. See, you know, you'd get a murder on a PM shift for three to 11 and you'd go home and come back the next day for your next shift at three. And, those guys from homicide who were there working when you left are still there. Right. They haven't gone home. You know, they're just working around the clock and they get so much respect and, you know, everybody just gets out of their way and they solve cases. And it was great police work. And that's what I wanted to do. I just said, when I grow up, that's what I want to do. So March the 23rd of 1981, I was called up uh, my first day in Sheriff's Homicide Bureau. So how does that work when, when you're in LA and your, your sheriffs, uh, whether it be gang or homicide or whatever, because you have LAPD there too. So how do they split the homicides between the, the different, uh, police departments there? Uh, how you don't stack up on each other or do you work them simultaneously or how, how does that work? Well, the, the way it works, I would imagine just like right there in Dallas where you're from, you have Dallas police department. Right. Then is uh, that you have, what is it? Harrison County or Harris County? Uh, you have uh, Dallas County. County. It's Dallas County. Dallas County. Yeah. Okay. So you have, so you have Dallas County Sheriff. Uh, we have the same thing here. We have the city of Los Angeles and you have Los Angeles County. The city of Los Angeles is an incorporated city and they have their own police department, LAPD. Okay. Uh, those guys are dressed in blue and they are well known for over the years from dragnet, the one out of 12, they've, they've got all the publicity. We handle all unincorporated areas of the county, as well as incorporated areas that contract through us okay. to investigate their murders. So all the cities around us, the small cities that, that encompass LA County, uh, if they're unincorporated, automatically they're under sheriff's jurisdiction. And if they're incorporated, then they have the option, they can have their own police department and their own homicide cops or most of them 
for homicides will contract through the sheriff's department to at least very minimally conduct their homicide investigation for them. And so LAPD does theirs and we do ours. So I said in the beginning, you investigated over 700. I think the number is closer to 800 homicides in your entire career. So my question is, how do you change as a, as a person, as a detective, as a cop? Um, because the problem that, that a lot of cops have is they get, they get jaded at the situation or uh, they, they look at the world in a different way. So with investigating that many homicides, how do you change from when you first go up and you're bright eyed and bushy tailed and homicide until all these years later and all these murders later, how, how do you look at it differently? And then I want to go into how it affects you and different things like that. But first off, let's talk about how do you look at it when you first get there? How do you look at it at the end? You have to have uh, great support. I have a wonderful family. My wife is the glue that has kept this marriage together. She's been supportive. You have to have a, a family that allows you the time. When you're working homicides, at least for sheriff's homicide, uh, if you consider it a job, then you're not going to be a good one. Homicide cop, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. So you have to know uh, that your time is their time. I don't care where you're at. They found me drinking in a bar and when I was in uh, Puerto Vallarta on vacation with my wife and friends. So they, they can find you anywhere, anytime they want to and you can't let it bother you. You've got to, like I said, you have to have an understanding family and understanding friends and then they keep you going. I have a large family to keep you grounded and you try to leave your work just there. It's at work. My personal life is my personal life and we have fun. Nobody's, nobody's had more fun than I have in life. And you can ask uh, some of your colleagues from Dallas police department. <laughs> We've had some fun. <laughs> we'll get into that a little later. We're going to talk about the infamous uh, RV and uh, Baker to Vegas. So, when you go there, you're you're so excited. That's what you've wanted to do this whole time. You you finally get up there. Now, it's not like you're new to it because you've been working gangs and you've been working homicides right alongside them. Now you are an actual uh, detective. So even that transfer over to there to be a homicide detective, I would imagine wasn't that difficult because they already knew you. They knew your work ethic. They knew how you worked. Um, so did you get treated like the new guy or did they kind of welcome you with open arms? You, you know, I, I was really afraid. I was, I was intimidated when I went up there because, uh, I'm sure some of them were saying, you know, he, Hey, this kid hasn't paid his dues. He's still a young buck. What's he doing up here? You know, this just doesn't happen. It takes an average of 15 years minimally to get to sheriff's homicide. And here I was with less than 10 getting the call to go up there. So I thought, Oh, they're going to dump all over me, you know? And I was wrong. That sheriff's homicide. Very proud to say that I was part of him. Uh, guy pulled me aside and he said, okay, sit down, kid. Here's what's going on. Uh, we have a vested interest in you. You're part of sheriff's homicide now, and we have a reputation. We have a reputation for working hard and being good. You will adhere to that reputation. You will work and strive to be nothing but the best. And if you try it, if you think you're that good, you can do something on your own and you screw it up. We'll bounce you out of here quicker than you can spell your last name. So we're all here as a team. We work together. We're here to help each other. Anything you need, any help you need, any advice you need, don't you dare hesitate to ask. And that's the way I was treated from day one. And I had uh, some of the, the the guy that broke me in, uh, Don Garcia, God bless him. He just passed away three weeks ago. He broke me in an homicide. He believed in me. He trusted me after we were split up as partners. He came up to me and says, you know, you don't know what you had until you no longer have it. Right. I can't tell you how much I miss you as a partner, what we did. I was the best man at two out of three of his marriages. And uh, the last one, which lasts until the day he, de <laughs> day he, he died. So uh, we were very close. I owe him everything that I am today. Uh, dude, I can remember one Christmas day. This was after we had been split for about 10 years. Uh, during training, he said, you will attend every autopsy. You represent the decedent. You speak on behalf of that decedent and his family. So you will attend every autopsy. And it was a Christmas day, Christmas morning, and I had a post. So I went down to the autopsy. And there weren't many cops in there at all. The 
the corners off those their staff were they were conducting their carving up a bunch of yeah. people. They had two rooms going and I looked over it and there was Don Garcia, the guy that broke me in an homicide. And I walked over to him and I said, I can't tell you how proud I am. And he says, why? And he's, I said, you not only talk the talk, you walk the walk. And he's, what are you talking about? I said, you instilled in me at the importance of being at your autopsies. And here I am on Christmas day and there you are doing what we get paid to do. And he looked around and he said, yeah. He says, you look around, we're the only two stupid idiots that are here working today. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I clean that up, trust me. <laughs> but uh, that's where you know they they instilled that stuff in me, and so I wanted to be good. Now you might not know the answer to this question, but do you remember your first homicide as a homicide detective? Do you remember the first homicide you worked? Yes, I do. Okay, yes, can I we do. go into that one a little bit? Sure. Okay. I can remember the very first one. I worked it not with the guy that broke me in an homicide. He was out of town. I worked it with a guy named Bill McComas. And Bill McComas, on the weekends, in his garage, he ran a carpentry shop. He did carpentry on his own. So he's telling me, he says, okay, kid, we'll be on a beeper. And if we get a murder during the day, he says, you're probably going to beat me there. It'll take me an extra hour to get there because I run a carpentry shop. And uh, I'll have to clean up. And I said, how can you do this to me? This is my first murder. And he says, hey, wait a minute. He says, you're going to be in a suit and tie. You know what we do basically when you get there. And you've, done, been, you've been around a bunch of us anyway. And he says, and those young deputies out there, they're going to, hey, they're going to look at you and say, hey, there's Sheriff's Homicide. He knows absolutely everything there is to know about murder investigation. And I said, Bill, that's good. But what happens if the murders at East LA Station where I was just working two weeks ago? And he said, well, then you're screwed. <laughs> he said, but good luck, kid. <laughs> Fortunately, the murder wasn't at East LA Station. It was a Firestone Station. It was a, a gang murder at a park on a Sunday evening, and it was great. And, and I remember him. I, I can remember after we were done, he just looked at me. And he said, I said, oh, he's okay. What's next? What's next, kid? And I said, well, we have to take this evidence over. We got to run it down to the crime lab. And he just said, nope, that ain't it. I said okay, well then uh, we need to get these recordings into our secretaries, take them down to the office. He goes, you know, and after getting about three or four no's, I said, well, Jesus Christ, what is there, what is there left? And he says, get something to eat, get something to drink. <laughs> says, it's time to have a drink. <laughs> and I said, okay. So we told, we went down to the local uh, distributor, Spiritus Fermenti, a place called the Code 7. And so we went in there, sat at the bar, and he says, okay, before we start, I'm going to tell you. He says, two drinks, and that's the limit. That's it. Two drinks. Because if we go for three, it's not good. I said, okay, two drinks. And I said, well, okay, let me buy the first one. He says, no, nope, you're the new kid. He says, I'm buying you the first drink. I said, all right. So he bought me a drink, and I said, okay, now it's my turn. I felt good. This will be the second one. I bought him the second one, and he, I said, okay, I guess it's time to go. He said, no, 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 you got to have one for the ditch. This is the one you hit, you take before you hit the road. And I said, okay, I'll buy. He said, no, you bought the last one. He said, I'll buy this one. And we started drinking. He says, kid, that's your first mistake. I told you the limit was two. If we go three, we're in for the duration. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, my, that was my first murder. And we did solve it. So it was... It was good. Well, I guess it all worked out then. Yes, it did. So do you remember the kind of the story behind it? Do you remember what happened, like the, the, the background on the actual homicide? No, it was, what we, if there is such a thing, it was a typical drive. It was a typical, uh, not drive by, but it was a typical shooting in the park. Right. Then you get in your car and you're, you get away. Somebody just came up as they, they say in the neighborhood, you know, you caught a guy slipping. He was by himself. And they just took advantage of him and killed him right there. It was at Roosevelt Park in the Firestone Park area. So, so did what gangs were you dealing? Because you, you were saying that that was kind of the gang capital in that area. So what, what gangs were you dealing with back then? Well, it, in East Los Angeles, they had several gangs. Uh, you, you had the typical, there was Garrity, which sat at the top of the hill, just like in any military, you get the top king of the mountain. You know, they watched everything down below 
they were, we affectionately call it, they were up in the Alps. Uh, you had Vario Nuevo, V and E, which is a big, pretty big gang down there, uh, out of the Estrada Courts, which was a housing project. You had Little Valley, which was in a little valley. You had El Loyo, which was in a hole. El Loyo meaning the hole. Uh, you, Maravilla, beautiful. You had Mariana, you had White Fence. Uh, you, there were just so many, uh, and named after streets, you know, there, there were just so many gangs that fought each other. Arizona and Maravilla was over in the Maravilla project. So, it, it, and they all just warded there. When I first got there, everything was territorial. Right. Uh, it wasn't, it, that, that's all it was. Then drugs started getting into it. Then drugs and drug sales started entering the gangs and then they started fighting for drugs and drug distribution rights and sales and ripping everybody off but they were shooting uh left and right just so many murders well you were kind of there at the introduction of crack cocaine i mean you were as it as it came to la well it, it was but by the time crack cocaine came around i was already working murders so I'm working murders, and when if we had dope involved, like crack mm -hmm. was involved, well then you then you go to dope cops, get them to help you, and let's find the cocaine trail. Uh, we had experts to do that stuff for us. So, at at this time when you're when you're working, you're past gang, you're in homicide now. As you start to work homicide, what do you notice differently? Because you're going to look at your uh, surroundings differently than when you were a patrol guy, you start seeing things differently. You start, I guess, noticing little things that don't appear to you as a patrol cop or stuff maybe that you remembered. How do you start looking? Because you're, you're still going to the same area a lot for these murders. So how, how does your perception of the world around you change? you you just, your, your powers of observation become very acute. You're looking at things. Uh, I, I, I guess the easy way to put it is when you're working patrol, you're arrest oriented. Right. So you're looking for the criminal, the, the crimes, the criminal and get them in jail. When you're a, a homicide cop or you're in the detective role, you're no longer looking at a, being arrest oriented. You're looking at prosecution oriented. So now you're looking at things very scientifically. You're very minutely, you know, acutely uh, everything you need to put together that case. that's going to help you win the prosecution. And so when you, uh, people call it, you know, they often say, how could you do that? Seeing all the blood, the guts and the gore. Well, you don't see blood, guts and gore. You see very scientific things that tells you that body's telling you what happened to it, what, which bullet hit first, which one second, which way he was standing, which way the blood spatter go, what type of weapon, uh, you know, there's things that, uh, the patrol deputy doesn't, doesn't realize manual strangulation. Or fixation will give you petechia. The, the little uh, vessels in the eye burst, and you see them in the eyes. You'll see them on skin, but a patrol deputy wouldn't know what what he's looking at. He just sees blood, guts, and gore, and that's what people see. Where we look at things a lot differently. Almost a a, a clinical perspective to it. Oh, exactly. I use that analogy often. A doctor who operates opens you up and sees everything that somebody sees from a gunshot wound, but he's looking at it very scientifically, very clinically to perform his job. Well, that's what we're doing. We get one crack at it. We can't put it, reconstruct it and have it used as evidence. We have, we have to study it and look good. You know, we see a cigarette butt down there. Hey, let's pick it up. There may be some DNA in there. You know, we, we go in there and uh, go to a crime scene, no smoking because we want to see well, somebody here smoking. Right. You know, there's just a, a lot of things, smell, taste, wind, lighting. There's so many other things that you're looking at uh, as a homicide cop and noting it to be able to document it accurately. So let's talk real quick about, I, I want to talk about, we're, we're going to stay in the homicide realm, but when you started working homicide and the, the way policing was done, the way investigations were done, the difference in that and how today is, because I believe that the policing is, is very different. And I know that's a very broad term to use. And I don't just mean technically, you know, they have more computers, they have more things like that. I believe that policing and investigations back in your time, when you're starting in homicide and as you're going through homicide 
are very, you have to go on a lot of gut feelings. You have to go on a lot of stuff that you've seen and put things together. And today you're more following uh, digital trails and overall evidence. Do you think that's correct in the in the way that I'm putting it? Because you were a homicide really guy at that know. time. Yeah, I, I really don't know because you have to take into consideration I've been gone for 11 years. Right. So I, I'm not out there. We did everything we can. There's more. Uh, they're just holding your feet to the fire a little more, and there's a lot more information available to you. Cell phones, as an example. You can get an awful lot of information from cell phones, Absolutely. from social media, but you have to write an awful lot more paper. Absolutely. So you have to you have to think outside the box. You get that information. You compile it, document it, put it together in a in a file, in a book form, and you follow whatever evidence it needs. You still have to put the pieces of puzzle uh, together. Where you run into problems is is what deputies out in the street have the ability to do for you now whether to make sure that it's a clean stop and not something that's going to be thrown out of court right, right. Uh, later on. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with you there about holding feet to the fire. The problem with that though, that I see is that a lot of people watch uh, NCIS and uh, that CSI and all this stuff. And they see them, you know, with these big computer labs and they're in every single police station and, and they're taking a fingerprint off a rock. And, and I, I think that it, I guess the word would be, I think it taints jurors and the public in general because they don't understand the real science that goes behind it because that's all they see over and over again okay. is this stuff on these shows. And, and I guess that was what more that I meant that, Back then, you could go on your hunches. You could go on the evidence. Now, people, when you get into court, they want to see, you know, everything. Well, it, it, that's true. They Ever since these programs come out, everybody wants DNA on everything. Everybody wants <laughs> fingerprints. Right. And and that that's just not realistic. That just doesn't happen. So what you do is you don't make anything up. You go with the best you got and hope that you win. You know, you still have to put your feet to the put your feet to the stone. You know, they, when I got there, they said there were the three S's, uh, snitches, scotch, and shoe leather will get you to solve cases. Uh, I never was a scotch drinker, uh, but I put plenty of shoe leather out there and you had snitches, snitches are, you know, they're, I hate working with them, but they're, they're a necessary, necessary evil for the job. Yeah. So you, you still have to do the same thing. You still have to entice people to help you. And I've always worked. It's much easier to treat people nice. You get more with uh, more out of them. And I treat people the way I'd like to be treated. And I learned uh, you have to have an infinite amount of understanding to understand why people did what they did. And you, you don't condone their actions. You just understand why you had to kill the guy or it just makes it easier to talk to them. Yeah, a, a lot easier because people don't understand. Sometimes these these interviews uh, go on for hours and hours and hours of of just talking. Sure. Uh, and sure. if you don't know how to talk to somebody, and especially when when people want all this, you almost have to have confessions now for everything. You you have to get, and even those, you know, they have this new philosophy, and I want to hear kind of your thoughts on it. It's, it's not new, but it's been brought up a lot more where they talk about these false confessions and yes. they've started using them a lot more where they say, well, that was a false confession. Certainly. What's your thoughts on those? Because I, I think that a lot of it is just smoke and mirrors bullshit um, compared to a real false confession. I just, I, you know, the defense is there to pick away at anything they can and if right. they can't get it off of evidence and they pick away your investigation. I've seen interviews that I've watched uh, these programs 48 hours or, you know, some of these law enforcement programs that come out. And as my wife and I are sitting there watching, I tell her, I tell my wife, that's bullshit. It should have been thrown out of court. They, you know, it was extracting. So what you do is you feed somebody information and they regurgitate it to you. And it's a false confession. It's no good. I used to lecture on interviews and interrogations, and I'm a firm believer that a confession is good as long as it's been been a proper interrogation or proper Absolutely. interview. You cannot feed them any information. Uh, I'm very particular about the words I use. Uh, you don't use 
words like robbery, rape, murder, when you're conducting an interview, those are harsh words. But you, you know, did they have bleach blonde hair? No, they had hair that was tinted, that was highlighted. You know, and it, the the man, it was an untimely death, as opposed to you murdered him. Right. You know, maybe you didn't do it intentionally. You know, you, there's a lot of words that you have to choose and be, be good at. And uh, I think a confession is is great. My my old my partner, matter of fact, my partner in the uh, night soccer case, Frank Salerno, uh, who had been there longer than I have, he was the big guru when I got there, and uh, he there towards the end, he said, "Hey, did you do your specialty?" And that's talk to these guys, treat them nice, and get them to go on video. And I've had people go on video walkthrough, show me how they did it on video. So it it, it works out. Treat them decent, and. Uh, It'll be good to you. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk about it for a few minutes. Let's let's talk about the Night Stalker case. It's, I mean, arguably one of the most famous serial killers ever uh, in in the history of crime. Uh, you talk about Frank Salerno, who was kind of like the man in homicide at that point. He picks you to be his partner. What goes through your head? You've wanted to, you know, you know, you've steadily gone up this thing. You wanted a plainclothes gang unit. You got it. You wanted to go to homicide. You went. Y you want to be partners with this guy. He picks you. What is going through your head? Are you thinking like at this point, man, nothing can stop me now. I'm I'm on a roll or are you nervous? Well, when he asked me, uh, I'm sure if you, ever, if you ever had a dog or a little puppy, when they get excited, they pee. And their tails really start wagging quickly. Well, I, I wasn't a little puppy, but I was so excited. Uh, we were at our Christmas party and he, we were up at the bar getting a drink. And and he says, hey, uh, Gil, he says, uh, what do you think about working with me as a partner? I need a partner. Would you consider it? And I said, sure, I'd consider it. You know, try to be cool. Sure, I'll do it. I'd been there all of four years little little else than four years sure so i went back and sat down with my wife and i said frank salerno just asked me to be his partner she says who's frank salerno i said god damn frank salerno you know he's the he's the king up here <laughs> and so i was i was really excited well a couple of months about a month later uh, if that long i ran into him at east la station and he says hey he says you got a minute and i said yeah he's so we walked outside and he says, you know, the other night when I asked you about being my partner, he says, I was in my cups and I figured, okay, now he's letting me down. Okay. He was drunk. He really didn't mean it. So I still got to be cool. So I said, yeah, so was I. And he says, well, I haven't been drinking now and neither of you, he says, would you still consider being my partner? And I said, sure. And he says, good. Cause I already went to the captain. It's going to happen. They're putting us together. So I was, I was really excited flattered honored he could have had anybody he wanted in that bureau and he chose the youngest guy in the bureau to be his partner and that was me the night stalker case uh it's it's kind of this guy's all over the place um you you really have to start putting some stuff together can you walk us through just an overview of the night stalker case well let me let me preface it by saying i saw things that others didn't but I owe everything to a uh, professor of mine at Cal State LA by the name of Dr. Robert Morneau, okay. a retired FBI agent. And I took two semesters of advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes uh, from him. And I learned more. Uh, we became friends. He's the best instructor I've ever had because he uses humor as a vehicle to get his point across. And if you're listening to summer, I learned how to teach from him because if you're funny, people pay attention because they're waiting for that next joke. They're waiting for the next anything humorous. And so they pay more attention and they learn more. And uh, so he gave me the ability to recognize things. And he would tell you something and he'd say, any reasonable and prudent sex crime investigator would note this as being indicative of a sexual deviant. And so with the very first murder that I had, Maria Hernandez, which was the summer of, it started March 17th of 1985. Uh, 
Maria Hernandez was a surviving victim. She had just arrived home. She had an electric garage door opener. Her, she was driving up, the garage door opened. She left it open. She exited her vehicle, went inside, walked on a carpet runner to the door that enters into a condo. She keyed that door and started to open the door while simultaneously hitting the button on the wall that closes the garage door. Somebody made a deliberate sound, hit the top of the car. She turned around and she sees a man using uh, a firearm in his hand, point shoulder, just pointing straight at her as he walked towards her. She said with a stargaze look in his eye and as he got closer to her within inches, the light went out. So from the time she pushes that button, it's eight seconds before the light goes out. Richard simultaneously pulls the trigger on the gun the bullet goes off, she goes down to the ground. Fortunately for her, she had some keys in her hand, the bullet struck the key in her hand and entered her hand and did not exit. Richard thought she was dead because he had shot her right in the face. He then just pulls the door open and goes inside. Maria jumps up, opens the door, uh, hits the button, she gets out. So about this time, she's running down the alleyway. If you were in the movies watching this, you'd be sitting there eating your popcorn saying, run, Maria, run. And she hears a second gunshot. So she runs around the front of the condo because she knows that her roommate, Dale Okazaki, is inside. She gets to the front of the condo where she confronts Richard, who has just exited the condo from the front door. And now they play a little cat and mouse game around the car. He goes one way, she slides the other. He slides that way, she slides back. She finally threw her hands up in the air and said, you really have to shoot me again. You've already shot me once. He put the gun by his side and he walked away. And so uh, that was the beginning. And we know that Dale Okazaki was shot right in the forehead, but she also had some contusions in the back of her head. And Frank wasn't with me on that case. I had a partner by the name of Jim Mercer and I'm sitting there saying to myself, why did he hit her in the back of the head? Why didn't he just shoot her in the back of the head? And why was there a deliberate noise before he shot Dale Maria Hernandez? Now, I didn't learn that till a few hours later because Maria survived, but those were things that troubled me. And we learned uh, the following morning that 50 minutes after the first murder, there was a murder about two miles away from another Asian lady that was driving her car. They found her in a, she had appeared to be panic reverse. The engine's running, the car's in reverse. She backed up into a parked car and she had been drug out of the car, front of the car and shot twice and left there. And the witnesses, the neighbors around the area said, it sounded like a boyfriend girlfriend fight. And he shot her, then he left. And so now I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute, one of the deviancies of a, one of the signs of a sexual deviant is they love to see people, the fear in someone's eyes. So I'm sitting there saying, why didn't he shoot those victims right away? And I'm saying, because he wanted to see the fear in their eyes. That's what Morneau gave me. But tried to tell that to anybody else, any reasonable cop, and I could understand why they didn't believe me uh, because that isn't so in criminal history because now as I'm working the Maria Hernandez case, I had him do a staff artist drawing. And so that's where you sit in front of the victim and you tell the artist what you saw and he draws it all out for you. And then you say, yeah, that looks like him. Well, as I'm showing this to the guys at East LA, the detectives at East LA station, uh, in walks a guy from our latent print section and he was still doing old identikits. That's where you had the acetate paper and you laid one on top of the other to form a lines and then you'd get a uh you put it on a xerox machine and there you had your what your guy looked like your suspect he said wait a minute hold that thought he went out to his car and he brought one out he said i just got done doing this one and they look like the same guy one was an artist rendition the other one was his identikit and then you look at the description and the one that was an identikit was a 12 year old girl attempted kidnapping and so you're saying, wait a minute, you know, this is now it's pedophilia, but the descriptions are the same tall, thin, uh, disheveled hair, dressed in black, stained brown teeth, gapped. 
and say, wow, that, now it's something else. And then we go over to uh, March of 10th and on March of 10th, there was a kidnapping of a 10 year old girl out of a residence in the middle of the night. And there was an Avia footprint left there. And her description of the guy was the same as the one for the 12 year old girl and the same one that Maria Hernandez had given after the murder of Dale Okazaki. On March the 29th, there was a, a double murder in the uh, city of Whittier. And all these murders are not far from each other. And at the murder for uh, in March, there was a, a footprint left behind by the suspect. We later learned that that footprint is that left behind by a model 440 Avia uh, athletic shoe, size 11 and a half, 12. Well, that shoe, you do a study on the shoe and you can, I can tell you that on January 9th, 1985, 1,356 pair of model 440 Avias, size 11 and a half, 12 entered the United States from New York, uh, via New York from Taiwan for distribution throughout the U.S. Uh, our shoe was black. There were six of them mailed that got to the state of California, one to the city of Los Angeles. It's a calling card. That shoe, yeah, and that shoe print was also left at the site for uh, Sandoval. Okay. So now we have shoe prints with kids. We have descriptions. So I'm thinking this is, you know, something different. April 10th, we had a meeting. There was one representative from the FBI at the meeting with other smaller jurisdictions that had had child abductions. And I'm there trying to push. I'm saying, okay, your child abductor is my murderer. And at that time, uh, they didn't believe me. And they scoffed at me. And I was being called names as soon as I walked out of the door. And they did this. But I, I really don't, they didn't have to call me names. But I understand why nobody believed me because nowhere in criminal history had it ever been documented that one man was doing the things that there were child abduction, boys, girls, weapons used were different, time of day, everything was different with this guy. His only consistency was his inconsistency. And so until we had uh, enough physical evidence and we got, you know, it wasn't until really July the 5th that we got uh, Frank realized we found another bloody footprint on a comforter inside a rape and attempted murder of a 16 year old girl. And then that was it. Then everybody agreed, okay, maybe Gil's right. You know, this is really, and we started working uh, together. Now, a, a question that I had was at this time, he was staying at the Cecil down in downtown Los Angeles. So how far is he from where these murders are being committed? Like how far is he tr going out to, to accomplish these murders from where he was at? Well, most of the murders occurred uh, within, uh, let's say, I'd say within 10 to 20 miles. The hotel was the hub. So he went out in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, then he started branching out into the West Valley. So he was 10 to 20 miles uh, some of them went further when he went down to Mission Viejo. Now we're talking maybe 60 miles south. He went up to San Francisco, so that was several hundred miles north. So he got around. Like I, I said, I used to use, uh, I think the game was called Tetris. Mm -hmm. That's where you, you hit the ball and it pings off and it goes, starts small and gets bigger and the angles get bigger, they get wider. That's what he was doing. He started local and he'd come back. And Central was always L.A. That was his home. So he'd go from there. That's where he had in downtown LA Greyhound bus depot that he used to use to keep, uh, we call it his kill kit, his clothes, his guns, he kept them in a locker there at the bus depot. And so he'd go from there. He'd go out for a night of hunting, come back, put his stuff away, and then go back to his hotel room. So you catch him, he gets put on trial. He becomes kind of like, a, I guess the only word to use would be like, kind of like a rock star when he's on, uh, he gets his teeth fixed. Uh, he starts getting letters from women. What do you think in, in all the homicides and stuff that you've seen, what do you think these people know? This guy is way off. Uh, he's done unspeakable things to children, to adults. 
what are these people thinking that are that it, are they just mentally unstable themselves or that question uh my friend you'd have to ask a doctor like i don't know what drives these people to do what they do i, I know one day i laughed with uh, my partner we're in trial on the case and there were two just beautiful women they looked like attorneys they were dressed very nice uh very nice suits uh skirts and their briefcases with them and they were just there sitting watching the proceedings and as richard walked by them richard always looked into the audience he wanted to pick out as he walked into court he'd scan the audience to pick out who the good looking ones were and as he left uh walked out of the court he'd look at the ones that he had picked out already well he looked at these two ladies and one of them sat, that was sitting right on the edge blew put her hands up to her mouth and blew him a kiss and spread her legs open for him so he could get a good gander and i went back to my partner and i said okay hook me up maybe i'll get lucky <laughs> you know because they were there to see him it was that easy uh, i have no idea why they did it what they were doing if they were just i have no idea another homicide that i want to talk about with you uh august 1999 this is the Rosemead quadruple homicide. I ask you, you know, we have, we've talked many times before uh, about just different things, what we were going to talk about on the show. And I ask you, is there a homicide other than, you know, uh, this major one uh, that has really stood out in your mind that, that you never forget about? And you brought this one up. As crazy stories go, this one is, is really crazy. Like, it, just the amount of violence that was inflicted, uh, how long that it went on and just the reasons behind it. So I want you to kind of set the scene and then we'll work through that homicide because you said this was the one in your mind that stands out. Yeah, it, it was a uh, quadruple murder. There were a few other people that were injured that survived, but all from the rage of a former boyfriend for her, you know, lack of better terms, husband, but they were just common law. They weren't, they weren't married. Uh, they had lived together for years. They had two teenage sons and they were separated. She had left him because she, he was violent. There was domestic violence. They had been separated for over two years. She had started dating a man where she worked and the ex had warned her, you better stay away from him. If I can't have you, nobody can. And he kept on her. And so she had just got a protective order. And one night they're at her boyfriend's sister's house. Okay. And it's the, the ex-girlfriend, her boyfriend, his sister, her husband, and two small kids in the bedroom. They're watching something on television. In the living room, that lady has uh the resident of the house she has probably three or four nephews in there uh sister and some other people in there and they're watching something else in the living room uh to this residence when all of a sudden they hear a commotion they hear gunshots and here comes the ex-husband in a rage into the bedroom he tells his ex's new boyfriend get down on the ground and he shoots him right in the head, right in front of her. He then gets the man of the house or the lady whose brother just got killed. Her husband tells him to get down the ground, pops him in the head. This lady has two small kids with her. The ex-girlfriend goes running out of the bedroom. The suspect goes running after her. This lady grabs her two kids and hides in the closet. She remains in there. She remains in there for about five minutes. Here's nothing else. And what we learned was during this time, he went up to his ex and said, you get out of here because you cannot, uh, I can't do anything to you because you are uh, the mother of my children. The lady that's in the closet hearing nothing opens the door and there he is waiting for her. He's just waiting for her to come out. He says, come on, let's go. And he walked her through this, uh, down the hallway, through the, uh, the kitchen, 
where one of her nephews is lying on the ground bleeding and he pops him in the head right in front of her two children as he had her brother and husband already. She begs for him to release her two small children. She will go with him and do whatever he wants. He lets the two kids go. They walk out of the house. As they're walking away from the yard and up the street, they see another nephew on the sidewalk bleeding. He looked at him and said, now you're going to die like the dog that you are and popped him in the head. He then kidnaps that lady and drives around. They go to get a flat tire, probably about six, eight miles away from where they were. So he gets off the freeway, they go walking and he takes her behind a supermarket and he rapes her right by the Dipsy dumpster. He then gets her up and they walk to a local dance hall where he wants to go dancing now. And she said, please, you know, I'm all dirty. Don't make me go in there. So they wait out there. And he said, okay, go ask that girl for a ride. Need to go to Omani. That's where the lady was going. So gave them both a ride. The ride ended. They got out of the car. The man started walking towards a friend's house, took her by the railroad tracks and raped her a second time. Then he flags down a taxi and the taxi driver says, where do you want to go? He says, well, take me over here to West Covina, another small city, not too far away. And taxi driver starts telling, boy, you're lucky. There's some crazy guy shooting people out here tonight. And so they go to the West Covina house. That's where the suspect's nephew lives. He then gets his truck. They put this lady in the truck. They drive her down. They release her. And the suspect has the his nephew drive him to the Mexican border and he disappears into Mexico. When I got there as an assisting investigator, I got there and helped out my old partner, uh, one of my old partners in Homicide Bureau, it was his case. And I had already interviewed for him the ex-girlfriend, got the story out of her. He was still doing the crime scene. I went back to the crime scene. I said, what can we do? He says, find the kidnapping victim. And we got a call. We got a lucky break. We found out where she was. We went and picked her up. We started riding around with her, trying to tell her, tell us what happened, give us a story. She would break out hysterically crying. And I was, it was just killing me knowing that here's this lady that had been through so much and having to tell a perfect stranger what went on. And we found out she had been raped. So we took her to the hospital, got her treated, got her examined. We then took her back out on the street. Show us if you can remember, we're trying to figure out which way they went. We found a gas station. We found video there at the gas station. That's now, we work all night and take, it's two in the afternoon the next day. And we've been at it since about eight o'clock that night, the night before. And other family members are waiting for her at the station. We got there to the station and uh, I couldn't even talk to the family. I was so broken up. I was crying. I couldn't talk. It broke me up so badly. I had my partner who was a female uh, she was relatively new at the time. And I said, you explained to the, she was a fluent Spanish speaker herself. I said, you explained to the family what went on and, uh, we'll see how it goes. Ultimately it, uh, Frank Gonzalez, who was my partner, uh, worked so hard, was under so much pressure, uh, for the unincorporated city in which the murder occurred in, uh, the local citizenry, everybody, it was an awful lot of pressure. But he eventually solved the case. The man was arrested, prosecuted, and is now in custody in Mexico. So a couple questions from it. One, did you ever find out what made him all of a sudden just say, okay, I'm done? No. No. no, no, I, no. I never spent any time with him at all. Mm -hmm. My job was merely to assist. Once I was done assisting, that's you all up to Frank Gonzalez. I'm out of it. Okay. What was it about this one? Because when you and I talked, I said, give me one that really sticks out in your mind. What was it about this one that one stuck in your mind so hard? And two, you by this time had seen hundreds of homicides. Uh, you, you couldn't even talk to the family. So what was it about this one that was so different from all these other ones? Just the agony that most of my victims don't talk. Right. They're dead. She had been traumatized by seeing her brother, her husband, two nephews, 
murdered and her two children were there. Then she got raped. The agony and the suffering that she went through, it was, it was so painful, it was hurting me. And I just, my heart just poured out to her. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't hold back. Uh, how did the partner handle it? I mean, I guess that everything was good, uh, and especially having a female partner, I, I would guess that would help you at the time. She was new, and she wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. That's just, that's that's what I can say. And I'm not anti-female at no, all. No, no, I, I get I it. That per- I want to make that perfectly clear. One of my best partners up there in Homicide Bureau, uh, we're still friends today, was a female who knew how to, Knew how to interview people. You you have told to, me about uh, her. So yeah, she she was good. And and this one, uh, just she got up there during the time where they needed females, so she got to go. I don't think she was thoroughly prepared for work in murders yet. So and, and that happens. This this was probably her second case that she rolled out on. So she just kind of awestruck over everything. And, and, and I mean, with everything that you say about this case, with all the stuff that went on with it, I, I can see it being overwhelming with it being a, a second homicide that you're working. Now, you said he's in Mexico now? Yes, he's in, currently in custody in Mexico. With all that, d- did you ever hear of anything after this one was over with the victims that were left alive or anything like Have you ever heard anything about that? No, I never followed up on it. Once again, it's not my case and everything you keep everything to your cases close to the chest. And right. So that was Frank's case. And he's just, he was big and he's an adult and he knows what he's doing. So, and everybody just works their own cases. So over your whole career, over 700 homicides, uh, you, you get towards retirement. When do you start knowing it, it, it's time to go? Uh, I don't know. You know, I didn't know that it was time to go. I really didn't want to go when I did. Uh, but it was coming up to a point where I had to make a decision, fish or cut bait. And I had had a re- recent uh, knee surgery and she had to take another physical to, uh, and it's not as strenuous as the one that you come on with, but you had to be examined. My knee would not have passed the physical. And I didn't know if they'd let me stay on long enough to go ahead and let the knee heal. And I did not want to go ahead and try it and then be without a paycheck for two to three months till the retirement kicked in. So I just went ahead and filed for retirement early and made it a simple decision. I, I still, after I, after I left, I missed it. I missed the work, I missed the call outs, missed the camaraderie, missed giving young deputies a ray of hope that there's something more to life than pushing a radio car around. And this is the greatest job there was. Any regrets? None. None whatsoever. I take that back. Yes, I do have a regret. I didn't spend more time with my family uh, during my younger years at Homicide. You know, I, I wish I could have spent more time with them. Although I never, uh, when my son was little, he, he played Pop Warner football. I made his games. Uh, my kids, I did everything. I was, went to their PTA meeting, but I just didn't spend enough time with them. I wish I'd have spent more. Anything that you wish you would have done on the department, not necessarily a regret, but anything that you wish you would have done, whether that be a school or a specialty or anything like that, that you didn't ever do? No, no, not at all. Uh, It it took me a long time to promote because I never wanted to leave Homicide Bureau. It was the greatest job going. And I thought if I promoted, I'd have to leave. And then we got a new sheriff and he said, you won't necessarily have to leave. So I said, well, now I'll take the exam. And I passed it. And so uh, that this, it's the... They say if, if, if you love your job, it's not a job. Right. And that's the way it was. I, I went to, I remember going to a middle management meeting and at the time, the guy, you went around a circle and you gave your name and how many years I said, Gil Carrillo, 35 years. And the instructor said, 35 years, you mean you're almost working for free. And he says, you're working for free. And I said, I understand that. And he said, well, no, no, I'm serious. If not for free, damn near it. I said, I understand it. And he said, why? I said, well, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, but just before the class started, I heard you talking with a couple of guys over in the corner saying you played a golf tournament two weeks ago and best damn golf tournament you ever played in and only cost you $250. He says, yeah, I love golf. And I said, that's my point. He said, what's your point? I said, you pay $250 to do what you love to do. I do it for free. And so he said, well, 
well, all righty then. I, I don't regret it at all. I loved it. And like I said, I was able to do it because I had a supportive wife. That's a, that's an amazing thing. Cause you don't, you don't see that a lot. I mean, you talked about your one partner that's been married three times. You, you, do, you don't see it uh, as, as often as you would like to see in that world. So you retire, you move on, your, your kids are older now. They all have good jobs. You're, you're with the love of your life still. What have you been doing since retirement? Well, I did a stint uh, three and a half months as an interim chief of police for a small city out here. Uh, since then, I, I left that and went to, uh, I was working, my last job was, I did a stint uh, with the Department of Children and Family Services. They asked me if I would work their internal affairs. Uh, then COVID hit, and we weren't doing a bunch of stuff. And just last month, I turned in my stuff, said, hey, you know what? This ain't worth it. I'm old, a lot of COVID out there. Somebody just recently died in the building. They had 10 positive cases in the building. And I said, you know, the sevens are all lined up and I ain't going to jump out there. So I just, you know, I didn't do it for the money. I did it just to stay active. Right. And um, so I just turned my stuff in and I'm doing nothing. I got a motor home that's in the shop getting, you know, annual tune up, getting it ready to have some fun. Let's talk about that uh, mobile home that you have there. Uh, a lot of friends of mine that know you say that uh, there's two things that you love when you come down there. There's a special kind of whiskey that you like and just the camaraderie of hanging out with those guys like you just said. But but every single guy that I know that knows you has said, man, his RV is the best. Every single one of them without fail. They've said that his RV is the best. So you got to tell me, what is it about this RV that's so amazing? Because that is the first thing that every single person mentions. The RV is only as good as the people that go inside. Okay. It's the people that make, it's people that make the party. And, you know, it could be a party of three. It could be a party of 30. It does make a difference. It's, it's how much fun you have. It's a 40 foot uh, Fleetwood diesel pusher. And we go in there and uh, we have fun dedicate uh to one of your officers now deceased braun and uh he was uh he was a great man him and i became friends years ago at uh vega to vegas and he, it's just fun being around the guys and i look forward to them being there my wife my wife doesn't look forward not to them my wife doesn't look forward to me <laughs> being with them he accuses me of consuming mass quantities of spiritus for menti. So, well, let, let's talk about that guy for a minute. Ronnie Barden is who we're talking about. Ronnie Barden. Uh, yes. That guy is one of the best guys that I ever met. Um, was always nice to me. Was always willing to teach people something. Uh, never turned anybody away. Uh, and and I think it's awesome that you do that. Uh, and you talk about that now, a couple of my other buddies that, that come down there and visit with you, they said that that's really how they got in contact with you in, in the beginning was through this, um, kind of toasting Ronnie's life and things like that. But they mentioned this, this honey whiskey that you like, and, and it's from Texas. So you got to tell me what it is about this whiskey that's so made. Cause that, like I said, when they mention you, they say the RV and they mention this whiskey. And I'm like, what is it about this whiskey? Cause I like whiskey, but I've never even heard of this stuff. I had never heard of it. The whole time I drink it from. <laughs> I, and I, 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 I told my wife, they put a gun to my head and made me drink it. I didn't want it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so w when I was originally trying to get you, I, I had sent you a message and stuff you saw it and you were like, I don't know who this guy is. So, I had seen that you were friends with one of my friends. So I texted him and I said uh, to Mark and I said, Hey, how do you know this guy? And, and, and he tells me the story and he goes, let, let me give him a call. And then you, you answered right back to me. But as you and I started talking, you were telling me that you're receiving like a hundred friend requests a day and people want you everywhere on podcasts in Ireland and Europe. And where do we go I, from here? Do we write my, a book? What, what is it? What are we doing? I, it, it's beyond my wildest imagination or ever expectation my wildest expectation i had no idea this was going to come about i just did a podcast yesterday uh for netflix in australia oh and, okay uh, we did it via zoom and 
I've had a request for one in Ireland right now. Uh, I've just been doing them left and right. Here I am talking to Dallas and, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. They saw the Netflix. I owe it all to, to the director, Russell Tiller and his staff. Uh, it was, uh, Tim Walsh, the writer that did it. These guys were just great. You know, I was a subject of their case of their, uh, program however they're uh, they're the ones that did all the magic they're the ones that put it all together and made it flow and put the music and uh went from one to the other yeah tiller is uh he is an amazing director uh he he did the seven five documentary he's done some really great stuff and i was glad to see him operation yeah i i was glad to see that yeah. he was part of this because i think he gave it kind of a touch that other people couldn't give so, and he's just a good man. Yeah, he's a good man. So, are we gonna are we gonna write a book? What what's up next? You've accomplished the three things you wanted to do in life. So, what do we got next? I I've been asked to write a book for years. I've been I've had people say I'm a writer. Matter of fact, Tiller suggested <laughs> he says it's now time for a book. Talk to Mark Allen. You know, he brings up this motorhome. I'm afraid to write a book. Uh, because I don't want to step on anybody's toes because I know people like my wife would be saying, Oh, I know who you're talking about there. <laughs> and I just, I, I, I don't want to get anybody in any trouble and I'm not talking legal trouble. I'm just talking about Absolutely. domestic strife. So I, I've always refrained. I would love to write, uh, if I wasn't so doggone lazy, I'd love to write an educational book for, for homicide investigations. You know, I've lectured all over this U.S. and outside the country on right. various aspects of homicide. I'd love to write a book that would be educational that cops could use, you know, uh, and, and nothing nothing elaborate. Have to have, if it's for me, i got to have a lot of pictures. You know, I've got to be a lot of pictures. <laughs> in it. I, a little bit of reading, a lot of pictures. Well, I mean, you could, Gil, I really think you should do this. I mean, you got to bring someone in that can help you write. There's people that do that. They'll just come in and ghost write for you. You tell them what to say and they'll put yeah. it in the right. I would love to see that. What I would really love to see is a book of your homicide investigations, like, you know, maybe five or 10 of your biggest ones ever, the, the full walkthrough of them, all that. I would love to see something like that. Well, it, it, never say never. There, There's a guy... Uh... A friend of mine, Dan Smith, who's now writing, I don't know what his pen name is. He's written about five books late, lately, and everybody tells me his books are just great. And he's my buddy, and I haven't read a, I haven't read one of them. <laughs> Matter of fact, there's a book written by Phil Carlo on the Night Stalker. I've never read that book. <laughs> and the only part I read was the, the interview uh, that I did with him, the investigative side. But I've never read the whole book. I've just never been a reader. Uh, where can people find you? They can find me just like you did, I guess. So, you know, well, that that wasn't the easiest way. Not everyone knows Mark. Personal <laughs> message. You know, I'm on uh, I'm on Facebook. You, you know, since since so many, but I told you, you came on in the very beginning, right? Right away. Uh, I now read and look at every one of the Facebook requests I get. That's got to take you all and, day. And, I, from the time I'm waking up in the morning till the time I go to bed at night, I'm either on the phone or on my iPad answering. And I, and I look at all of them. I look at all of them and I've never taken on, uh, before it was, if you didn't know me, you weren't get you weren't going to be my friend. I, I wouldn't even let my kids friends, I wouldn't even let them be part of me. But because I told my wife, this has made me a public figure and I don't want people to think that I'm too, that I'm better than anybody else. Cause I'm not, I'm just another regular I'm just folk, just plain folk. That's all I am. Just have right. fun in life. I think and you might be selling yourself a little be. short there. Uh, I, I think so. But I think that's going to be about it. Uh, if you want to catch Gil a little further, you can watch on Netflix, Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. It's uh, an amazing look inside the case. And, and uh, Gil is very candid in it, talking about the case, talking about himself, talking about his family. And it's a, it's a good way to binge. Uh, other than that, like he said, Gil is on social media. If you want more of us, we're on Facebook at the DTD Podcast. We are on YouTube and we're on Twitter at Doublespeak DJ. So I think that's going to be it for tonight. Is there anything else you want to add, Gil? No, that's about it. Uh, thank all your viewers. Watch uh, 
wants a Netflix gig, and who knows, there may be a series coming out after this. There you go. Somebody will jump on a series. There you go. So that's going to be it for tonight, guys. That's Gil. I'm DJ. This has been the DTD Podcast, and you always come here because the best stories are true. We'll catch you guys on the next one. See you later.